Inside Athletics comes to you this week from Arizona. We are just outside of Flagstaff. And we're here to talk to one of Great Britain's brightest stars in athletics, Greg Rutherford, who won the Olympic long jump title last summer in front of his home crowd. In fact, he was part of one of the most spectacular evenings in the history of British athletics. And I'm here with Greg Rutherford, MBE. <laughs> <laughs> How have you been? I'm um, very well, thank you. Yeah, just uh, just had a light start to the season over in Australia and just got here about a week ago. Um, so yeah, it's not been too bad. And I had a right first competition, really. It's uh, yeah, been a decent build. Now let's talk about August 4th, 2012. If it's not at the top of British athletics history, it's certainly in the top two or three. It's the night that yourself and Mo and Jess uh, brought home Olympic gold on home soil in London. Tell me about what you recall about that night. Oh dear, yeah. Um, it's a tough one to, to remember properly because again, first of all, you, you go out there, as you know, you always go out there really focused and you're trying to think about what you want to do and you want to do well. After the qualification the day before, I knew I was, I was in a good position to win a medal at least and, and in a great position to try and win it as well. And, and going out there, the, the crowd were, were absolutely ah, just different, <laughs> just out of this world, like truly yeah. amazing. I'll never forget, I was in 2006, I was in Australia for the Commonwealth Games. And I always said that was the greatest crowd I'd ever seen because they just went so crazy. They had the MCG full and, and they just went absolutely out of this world. Every time an Australian athlete went out there, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden I had this in London, this crowd that every time we ran down the runway it went insane. And, and they had the build up of, of poster girl Jess Ennis about to go out there and win a, a, an Olympic gold medal. So the crowd were already in a frenzy. And then all of a sudden it happened for me as well. <laughs> and it's gone even more mad. And then, and then Mo comes along. So like the. The night ended up becoming, rather than remembering the performance as such, just that 45 minutes of just the crowd going more and more insane and all of a sudden me having a realisation that the one thing I'd always wanted, I'd just achieved and and it was really hard to put that into words. It's, it's, oh, it gives me goosebumps now, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a strange feeling and just, just a night I think that, that will always be remembered in, in British athletics which I'm incredibly thankful to be a part of. Now you don't have to go too far up in your lineage to find some pretty good footballers. Yeah. How do we? How did? How did football lose lose you to track and field? Um, it's a strange one to be honest. I think I probably looked better at football than I actually was. Um, really? Yeah. I, th I think. Because you was, had a, a tryout with Aston Villa when you were yeah, a young kid. Yeah, I was about 13, 14. It was a strange one. I think for me, I was always the quick kid at school and and in the county and everything else. So wherever I played football, I was put up front uh. and. Kids so you're football. faster than kids on the football. Exactly. So I'd love the ball <laughs> over the top. Nine times out of ten, one of them with a keeper, you score. And I think that that sort of inflated my ability a bit more than than actually what it was. It's and very humble of you. Well, I, I think, I think, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think. Uh, well, maybe Aston Villa. They've, they've been struggling in recent <laughs> recent times. So, uh, but some of the the top top teams, I, I very much doubt I would have been good enough to ever play for them. But I mean, the, the thing that I found it, and at that time, possibly I could have taken football onto a, to a higher level, but. I just didn't enjoy it like I enjoyed track and field. Again, I was sort of 14, 15 when I was really starting to find out about track. I mean, I've been doing it for fun up until sort of 13 and, and I just did it for like my school and never went to a club and, and just did bits here and there, ran for my school and just to say, enjoyed it. All of a sudden, I think you get a bit older, track and field is a mixed sport, so there's also girls involved as well. <laughs> and you, and exactly, and you sort of turn out to track thinking, ah, this is a better place to be than a football field. So I put more effort into, into training for track than I did football, and, and then football just sort of fell away, and, and I just didn't enjoy it, so I just thought, I'll leave that. But again, for me, I, pl I played every sport that was going. I mean, I played badminton to a relatively high level randomly. It was wow. just a, a weird sport to play, but I really enjoyed that, and the rugby as well, and a bit of cricket in the summer, and any sport you could throw at me, I would, I do, and, I, and I've always been like that, and I st still to this day, I love trying new things, and it's, and it, it's, it's a great part of, of learning, I think, with track and field as well. If you, if you learn these different skills from different sports, yeah. I think it really transfers in, into the track as well. You were a, a very good junior, you were a European junior champion, um, but then your results were, were pretty average until you got this, this gold medal last year. There are a lot of young athletes out there who will not survive what I call the gap, and that is being a good junior and then seeing really good senior results. What would be your advice to them about your experiences and what you learned within that gap? Yeah, for, for me, it was a really interesting because my junior time was was mixed. Up until I was 18, I wasn't a particularly great athlete. I think I was probably top 10 in 
sort of Britain as a junior if I was lucky then all of a sudden 2005 came around I grew into my body a little bit more and I became world number one as, as a junior and and for me all of a sudden I thought well now I'm just going to go and I'm going to win medals everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I won the European Juniors, right, I'm going to go and win the Olympics in 2008. And, and sort of, you get this elevated view of how things work in track and field. It might be all well and good winning as a junior, but seniors are a hell of a lot different. And you've got athletes who have been there for a very long time and who are the greatest in the world. Now, it's not just that age group, you've got them all. So it becomes much, much harder. For me as well, I suddenly thought, well, you know what? I've been training relatively lightly for this sport. How about I now dedicate every moment of my time to training as hard as I possibly can and pushing myself to the limit? Problem was, I didn't listen to my body and injury setting. I had breakdown after breakdown with, with hamstrings and ankle problems. I've had surgeries because of that. And, right. and just generally, that started to get on top of me. All of a sudden, I'm now not enjoying the, the one sport that I've given up everything else for because wow. I did love. And then mentally, you're going down, your body's falling down, and then it takes I think a really, really big change in, in your lifestyle and, and, and your, your personality, I think, to, to, to look at what's going wrong and trying to change it. So for me, basically, I pushed it too hard. I thought, now, if I, if I again, train twice a day and, and double everything and, and, and push it, as I say, to that limit, I'll get much better. So it was a question of you had to learn how to work smarter rather than yeah, harder. Yeah, exactly. Again, I, I'm... I'm not blessed with the body that can take a load that others can, because it always seems, no matter what happens. You're 190 pounds. Uh, yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's yeah, and, and and for whatever reason, I can somehow jump pretty long into a, a sandpit. <laughs> but w with the body shape I've got as well, the impact taken, it hurts. Like it's yeah. it's not great. And no matter what technical changes you do, your body needs time to repair. And and I was never listening to that. So I, I went from this transition of having a lot of fun as a junior and had a really great year into taking it so serious that I wasn't listening to, to the key part of me, which is my body. And and now I've, I've gone into a position where discussing with Dan, we look at some days, I'll turn him to track and Dan look at me and just go, okay, it's a light day today. You're not moving well. Right. Your body doesn't look right. And you haven't recovered from, the, from yesterday's workout. Exactly. So you have to be smart about these things. Before I would turn him to track, I'd get on with it. I'd get it done. And all of a sudden it'd be that extra rep. I'd go, right, okay, we do do an extra 100 or something, all of a sudden, pop, there goes another hamstring. And you're sort of going, this is getting, this is just, just oh, ridiculous. It's getting too much. And as I say, didn't enjoy it, but made a change. And then found I can love the sport again, train smarter, get better, and I've become more consistent and, and turn around and win medals. So, so that's the way you've got to be. And enjoyment's a huge, huge factor of it. And for me, I travel with, with a close friend of mine, Andrew Steele, and, and he's, He's a mate of mine who we've been mates for a long time and, and it's just good to have another person at the track. He's an Olympic semi-finalist in the 400 himself and, and then to have somebody that you can you sort, of, sort of always bounce ideas off and, and have a bit of banter with as well, that helps as well. You've got to be enjoying yourself at the track and surround yourself with people that, that you enjoy being around and, and I've now luckily put myself in that position so things have got better. Now with your performance at the Olympic Games, your life is forever changed back home. Uh, talking to Steve Hooker, he talked about how much he enjoys being out here in Arizona where he can just train, be anonymous, and not have to deal with it. Um, I imagine he's probably a little bit more popular at home than you are, yeah. but you've got to be pretty close. Um, could you train at home right now? Um, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, the problem is you go to any track, and especially in the UK, you have to train indoors because especially when the winter is, it's yeah. pouring down with, with snow and rain and everything. It's not, it's not good for track and field. but. You go in these places and often there's, there's school kids and, and other people there, which is fantastic and that's what you want to see at a track, but ultimately... Not when you want to train. Not when you want to train, no. You want to be able to just get your head down and focus in and, and the way things have been and, and some of the things that I've done in the UK since the Olympics have meant that people do want to talk to you, they want to come up to you and, and get involved and, and sort of I don't know, autographs and that sort of yeah. stuff. I mean, again, all the things that you've probably had to deal with for a very long time. And, and for me, I was thrust into that very, very quickly. It went from nobody really giving a damn what, what I did or, or where I was to a lot of people caring. And, and in the UK, it makes things hard. So I get out here, switch off completely, just be, be a normal athlete. And, and the great thing about track and field, I think, if, no matter what happens, your group always stays the same and they'll still give you the same same abuse and whatever yes. else they, they would normally give you the track. No matter what you've won and what you've right, done, right. you turn up to track to train. And, and we come here because nobody in America cares what happened on Super Saturday, really. I mean, a few track fans <laughs> will, but in general, nobody's going to care that right, much. So right. you come here, you train hard. And, 
and that is key because ultimately I've got more to achieve in my career. I want to want to win more championships. I want to jump much further. So staying in the UK, I can't do that. So here it works better. Well, on the subject of uh, on the subject of championships, um, world championships this year in Moscow. It, it seems to me like you're in a very uh, convenient position. Even though you are the Olympic champion, you probably will not start those world championships as the favorite for the world title, which to me makes you more dangerous. What, what are your thoughts as you, as you head to the world championships in terms of, um, one, your readiness, and two, the pressure on you? Yeah, it's, it's a great thing. I think Trek and Field News didn't even put me in the top three to win a medal, wow. which, which I found were quite interesting and that's <laughs> and again but that, that I mean that's that's a good thing on one level I mean it's sort of saying that they definitely think I was a one-hit wonder <laughs> which I am when not track and field, they, we say one year one <laughs> yeah one Same year thing, one it's, it's, it's exactly the, it's the equivalent yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case but no from my point of view I again I, I've, I've luckily I've sampled winning and that that's a big thing I yes, think yes, once yes. you've sampled it once and you know what that feels like you you want it a lot and and you want that to happen every year and and you know how to go through the phases of, of trying right. to get there which right. I think puts me in a great position. And then people now saying again, they don't think that I can go out there and win a medal. That's brilliant, that's fine. I'll just sneak in the back door again and, uh, and hopefully come away with the title. For me, it's all about winning. I do this sport because I love the fact that it's an individual sport that I can win. If I have a good performance, it's down to, to me and my team that we've done to get me there. If I have a bad performance, often it's something I've done wrong. And you can assess that. So. I know going forward, I know what to do, what helped me win last year, and I know that we're going to keep getting better. So people just, just have to be ready for me to, to come out there and, and jump well again, because I want to win, and I'll be doing everything I possibly can to do that. Well, let me say this to you. On behalf of everybody who was in that stadium that night, and on behalf of everybody who saw it watching at home, um, I think British track fans are among the very best in the world. Most certainly. And for being a part of that night and getting it done, I want to thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And thanks Jeez. for joining me. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Our thanks to Greg Rutherford for stopping by and chatting with us. On your screen now is how you can reach us via email, Facebook, and Twitter. We want to encourage you to continue to send those clips in. You know we're going to have future shows where we're going to answer viewer mail. If you want to be on that show, continue to send your clips. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. We'll see you next time on Inside Athletics.